Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Cato Institute. My name is Huan Zhu, and I am a research associate at the Herbert and Sifo Center for Trade Policy Studies at the Cato Institute. The emergence of technologies has produced new avenues for commerce, and that has greatly transformed the trade landscape. The digital space has become part of our daily lives, especially with the outbreak of COVID-19. However, the digital economy faces a number of challenges as governments grapple with different approaches to managing this fast changing area. Some countries are taking actions that will restrict digital trade and others are pushing for international rules to avoid too many divergent rules. What are the main obstacles in digital trade negotiations? How do we balance the different policy goals? And what is the possible way forward? I'm happy to have three excellent experts in digital trade with me today to talk about all these questions. Let me introduce them briefly. Christine Bliss is the president of the Coalition of Service Industries. Prior to that, she was the assistant USTR for services and e-commerce. She served as the lead U.S. negotiator for services and financial services in the TPP and the WTO Doha service negotiations. Stephanie Honey is an independent trade policy consultant. She is also a policy advisor to the New Zealand members of the APEC Business Advisory Council and associate director of the New Zealand International Business Forum. Before that, she served as a New Zealand trade negotiator for many years. Hannah Norberg is a trade policy advisor and has done numerous trade policy assessments for the European Commission, OECD, and WTO. She is also the founder of the Trade Ec Economista and of Trade Experts. For those who are watching this online, Feel free to post your questions on social media and use the hashtag CatoTrade, capital C, capital T. I will try to get to them as many as possible. Also, please visit the event page. We have some additional materials related to digital trade that you may find interesting. Let me start my questions with Christine. Digital trade has grown rapidly over the past two, three decades. It was estimated that 60-65% of the global GDP will be digitalized by 2022, and the COVID pandemic is probably accelerating that trend. Christine, can you explain to us what is digital trade? Do we have a definition? Is it the same or different from e-commerce? And what is the impact of a digital trade on the U.S. economy? Christine? Well, Thanks very much, Han, and, and thanks for the opportunity to join this very distinguished group, um, and, and Stephanie and Hannah in particular, so thank you, and thanks to Cato for sponsoring this event. Um, so you're, I think, right to start with this basic question, because I think there is some lingering confusion about the uh, use of the term e-commerce and also digital trade. And I think the best way to look at it is maybe from a historical context that when the internet, the advent of the internet and um, its first invention and its discussion in the World Trade Organization back in the 90s, I think there was use of the term e-commerce. And the way the WTO work prog program on e-commerce defined e-commerce was the production, distribution, marketing, sale, or delivery of goods and services by electronic means. And then you had the e-commerce moratorium that was adopted back in 1998 that referred to a, uh, an agreement not to impose duties on electronic transmissions. So what's happened over time, and I think Historically, e-commerce has been much more associated with online buying and selling distribution of goods, even though it was meant to also extend to services. Um, but I think over time and much more recently, what you have is a recognition of a broader term of digital trade. 
and there really is a, a direct overlap with e-commerce, I think the, the difference is that it's meant to be more all-inclusive and that it's not just about trade in goods online. It, it is more inclusive and extends not only to goods, but also services. And the other thing I think that's very important to mention is that the digitization that you refer to in the beginning of our discussion is occurring certainly on the good side with respect to actual products through the advent of 3D printing, although it's not yet really as ubiquitous as some might have expected. You have the digitization of content, which has been going on for a, a fairly long period of time. But then you also have increasing digitization of the delivery of services. So all of these things combined to create what we now refer to more broadly as, as digital trade, if, if that helps um, as a sort of the, the uh, premise and, and basis of our discussion today. And I also want to highlight that I think one of the key pillars of e-commerce digital trade was the adoption of the e-commerce moratorium back in 1998, which has been extended by WTO ministers ever since then, has been incorporated in various free trade agreements, all the US free trade agreements and many others, certainly the ones that Australia and New Zealand um, have, have entered into, and I believe the, the EU as well. Um, so that's a very important piece. With respect to the US economy um, and the impact of digitalization, the impact has been huge. Um, and particularly COVID has really promoted a rapid increase of digitization across the board um, in terms of how we live our daily lives, how we engage in business. Um, and certainly the most obvious example of that is that many, if not most of us, are conducting business on a remote basis now. So let me stop there. Thank you, Christine, for your brief introduction. Uh, I see that um, the scope of digital trade is very broad. So as it, as much impact as it has on our lives, uh, if there are some good reasons to um, promote facil digital trade. And to do that, we probably should remove all domestic barriers so we can maximize the benefit of the digital economy. Um, there has been some progress made in that front. Uh, many regional trade agreements now have rules related to digital trade, but they are mostly different in coverage and requirements. Broadly accepted international rules remain elusive. Christine, in your opinion, what are the biggest obstacles to form multilateral rules in this front? And what do we stand to lose if there is no consensus on a baseline set of rules? Christine? Thank, thanks, Han. Um, so starting out with the first part of your question, um, in terms of biggest obstacles, I think that certainly cross-border data flows, which underlie what we're talking about in terms of enabling all digital trade, is a critical piece um, and one that we've not um, adequately secured as yet. And you rightly refer to the differing provisions in various free trade agreements and also the real gaps that exist in WTO rules with respect to cross-border data transfers. There are some basic obligations uh, that are referred to in the financial services understanding and also in the telecom reference paper and annex where there is an acknowledgement of transfer of information across borders. Um, but the WTO doesn't really go beyond that in an explicit way. In FTAs, you do have the cross-border data flow provisions in the um, US FTAs in CPTPP, in um, a number of the, and many of the FTAs that 
Australia has entered into, certainly in DEPA that I know Stephanie will, will talk about in greater detail later um, in Latin American FTAs. Um, and it's one area where unfortunately the US and the EU still don't see eye to eye, largely because over differences of protection of personal, personal privacy. The second piece is the ongoing effort that needs to be made to tackle the problem of data localization. And that what that basically means is that when a country decides that when you're dealing with primarily personal data, although in some cases, um, business data as well, non-personal data, that you have to keep that data located in that country's territory. So you have to have a data storage uh, center in that country. And that creates myriad problems, uh, just to name a few, certainly in guaranteeing the security of that data, the reliability of that data when you need to send it back and forth across borders. Um, and, and so that's another uh, huge problem that has been tackled to some degree, again, in US FTAs, in um, CPTPP, um, and in DEPA, uh, but more needs to be done, particularly on the financial services side, where data localization uh, requirements in financial services were only tackled fairly recently in the USMCA um, and in a number of the Australian FTAs. And I believe, and Stephanie can correct me, in, in DEPA as well. Um, and interestingly, that is one area where the US and the EU uh, do share some common interest on data localization, even though not on cross-border data flows. Um, let me also turn to, um, and that's very broad brush, uh, but let me turn to some of the, the downsides of not having data flow, uh, free data, cross-border data flows, prohibitions on data localization. And I think um, what the consequence of that is that you have the lack of availability of uh, the latest technology and services to deliver um, the best quality, whether it be telemedicine or it be even just as a small merchant, uh, engaging in the global marketplace and getting your, your goods delivered on in a timely and efficient manner and having global market access. Um, in the COVID context, it became very front and center in terms of delivering essential goods and services uh, where you could have those essential goods and services held up if there were in fact barriers to cross-border data flows. Um, and, and so I think the consequences are very grave to the extent that countries, um, unfortunately, China, India are, are very prominent examples that are ring fencing their economies and creating walls uh, to create data sovereignty. So let me stop there. Thank you, Christine. Um, you mentioned uh, telecom, telecommunication, um, telehealth. Uh, where the doctor can see the patients through internet. Uh, with the pandemic, we've seen an increase in telehealth. With, um, do you think it's possible we'll see more international trade in this service with the patient being able to see the doctor in another country? And what kind of rules do you think will, need, will be needed um, for, to allow that kind of service to happen? Christine. Yeah, if the, the, that question is directed to me. So um, telehealth, telehealth is a good and maybe a not one of the better examples. It's good in the sense that it is a critical service and it's certainly one where you want to promote the greatest availability of good quality medical services to the, the general population. I think it may be more relevant in a domestic context than an international context. Um, for the very reason that uh, you cite in your question, Han. And that is that different countries, and the US is a prime example, um, have different kinds of professional requirements for doctors and nurses 
and the type of licensing that, that needs to occur in order for medical advice to be provided within uh, a U.S. state or U.S. territory. So um, I think at least with respect to the U.S. market, there's going to have to be a, a greater agreement internally uh, that there can be ways to meet specific licensing requirements in order to provide those uh, telehealth and tele telemedical services. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I, I think it is a very important area where um, certainly more needs to be done. And uh, certainly in terms of services that are related to the provision of telehealth, um, such as uh, advances in drug research or uh, ability to set up and operate uh, operating theaters, um, that kind of service may become more frequent on a cross-border basis. But again, there are a lot of domestic hurdles that have to be tackled in the U.S., and whether it's individual state licensing requirements or in a country like the UK or Canada, where you have a national health service, where you will have to meet whatever specific requirements there are to provide a particular service to that national health service. Thank you, Christine. Hannah, I'm gonna move my uh, move the next question for you. Uh, what, in your opinion, are the biggest hurdles for negotiating international rules on digital trade? Well, thank you so much, Juan, for um, uh, just not just for having me and the trade experts here today, but also using your very important platform for hosting a discussion about digital trade, which is a topic that is, you know, such a buzzword, um, yet so many, so few actually know much about it. Or let me even rephrase that. Very few know that we know so very little about it is what is my point, right? Um, and so uh, the first thing that we need to understand when it comes to, um, I'm gonna talk about data flows, cross-border data flows. And so the first thing that we need to understand is that the rules that are currently governing data flows along the World Wide Web uh, are not worldwide. They're not global or even international. They are a patchwork of national reg regulations. And regulations are a national sovereignty so countries have the right to regulate their data as they see fit, just like they have for other matters, you know, whether or not to use chlorines to watch to uh, wash chickens or if GMOs are safe, safe or other um, issues, right? That uh, are national regulations and we are used to dealing with in trade negotiations. Well, the thing with um, data flows is that on top of potentially being something that we call protectionist or trade barriers in nature, uh, which we usually say if they are if they are overkill uh, for international actors, so it's harder for an international than a domestic actor. Um, and that's the measuring stick that we usually use for discussions regarding regulations for uh, SPS or TBTs uh, at the WTO. So that's one thing that we're used to, but uh, the thing with, with data flows is that local regulation can very well have global repercussions. And so regulations are not all protectionist per se. They may very well have valid standings as protecting national safety or keeping harmful or unlawful content out. Uh, so the really big question for us is to wonder about where the scope is for discussion and for cooperation and where we in that case would do it. So regarding that scope, uh, two years ago, my colleague Susan Aronson at GW in DC, uh, and I, we set out and looked at this at a project which is reported at digitaltradepolicy.org if you wanna you know, check it out. Uh, so we set out to map out the regulations that are currently in place across the world and to see if there was a consensus uh, you know, how to define protectionist or some other common denominators. And so we looked at the regulations that are in place and we spoke to regulators, private sector actors, academics, policymakers, and NGOs. And to make a long story short, there was none. 
it was obvious that the definitions were as many as the interviewees and um, that they were even changing as the project went along. So, for example, when the EU first set out the GDPR, there was a very strong opinion that the, this was a protectionist measure, a trade barrier. This is, a, you know, something that was a power grab by the EU. It was not good. But then uh, Cambridge Analytica broke. And in the shadow of that scandal, experts then started saying not having measures in place to guarantee personal privacy is what is a barrier to trade. So these things are changing and evolving. And as Christine was saying, def the definitions we're working with are 20 years and more old. So, um, so we don't have these definitions. We don't have sort of place to, but uh, a place to start from. But what's even more urgent is that we don't have a place to have these conversations. So we have no place to get started on, you know, making common definitions for those discussions, having a venue on convergent views on uh, what privacy is, what is personal data, what is not personal data, um, what are legitimate concerns that we work with in regulations, and are the regulations actually up to doing that job, to fixing that that we're worried about. And so for now, since we don't have, you know, the discussion place or the common denominators to start from, countries are really just have the option of going on their own. And new regulations are coming up on a daily basis, which by the end of the day is an issue for firms that are trying to adhere to them. And it's an issue for those that are trying to tap into the data to, for example, like Christine was saying, maneuver the pandemic. Um, to tap into economic growth and to develop AI and so things, right? So the problem that we're really heading into is that setting these regulations up are pretty easy, but removing them is a lot harder. Thank you, Hannah. There are, it seems that there are strong reasons why we should have uh, more, um, inter uh, more international rules uh, to, uh, fill the gaps among you know domestic rules uh, but it's uh, it's a very difficult task as Christine and Hannah pointed out and that difficulty is evident in the e-commerce negotiations at the World Trade Organization. The work on e-commerce at the WTO started two decades ago uh, resulted in the temporary moratorium on custom duties on digital transmissions but other than that there was a little progress and then several years ago, we have a group of WTO members decided to begin negotiations of trade rules on e-commerce. Stephanie, can you give us an overview of negotiations at the WTO and what are the main sticking points? Steph? Thanks very much, Juan. And uh, thanks also to Cato for this, this great conversation about a really important issue for, for the world. Uh, so. You asked about, uh, you know, how the process is going, but I think it's it's quite useful to start with a little bit of the history. Uh, as as Christine and as you have commented, you know, we do have some rules at, at the multilateral level. So the WTO has been talking about e-commerce. Um, for 25 years and in fact quite a lot of the existing rules, you know, credit to the, the people who are involved uh, back in the Uruguay round and in, in the GATT, uh, you know, a lot of the rules have served us reasonably well up until today and, you know, we're designed to be, if you like, technology neutral. But it's also become increasingly clear that we really need to take a fresh look at how those rules actually fit with what's fundamentally a kind of a borderless global kind of commerce. So, I mean, there are a lot of qualities about the digital economy, which are quite different to the sort of old world, if you like, of, of physical goods going across borders. I mean, uh, as, as Christine and Hannah have talked about, you know, it's not always very clear where a digital good or service is being produced, where it's being consumed. Um, there are clearly transactions happening, but no money may be changing hands. So there are some qualities to do with digital trade and the digital economy that, that are not a hugely good fit with those existing rules that are 25 years old now. 
And I think also as part of the broader conversation about the WTO, there's been quite a sense that actually we need to update it and modernise it and, and keep it sort of relevant and fit for purpose. And of course, um, the way technology has evolved and business models have evolved, um, you know, far outstrip those those rules from 25 years ago. If you like, we really need to sort of untangle that patchwork or untangle that digital noodle bowl that, that Hannah talked about and ensure that these rules are actually interoperable across borders, across different economies. So as you say, Juan, you know, two years ago, negotiations started among a group of WTO members, although in fact, there'd been an exploratory process for a year or so before that. Um, and the, the group of interested parties uh, involved in these negotiations has now grown to around 86 members. So about half of the WTO membership, and that includes all of the developed economies and, and quite a few of the developing countries as well, although certainly not very many least developed countries, and there are a lot of um, other developing countries and, and regions, the Pacific, the Caribbean, and so on, that, that are not really very involved in these processes. But I would say uh, the main players in digital trade are involved with, with the notable exception of India and South Africa. And these, these negotiations have really grappled with some of the issues that, that Christine and Hannah have talked about. Because, you know, where we started this conversation, the questions of scope, definitions and so on, what is it that we're talking about, are still very much unresolved. Um, some of the challenges to do with, uh, you know, things that were really not even a gleam in people's eyes uh, at the, the time of the Uruguay round when those early agreements were negotiated are now very much to the fore. Um, things like privacy and cybersecurity that are particular to the digital economy don't, you know, there's no obvious uh, part of GATT or the GATS or, or any of the other uh, agreements that touch on digital trade that cover these things. So there's this fundamental challenge around what we're talking about in the WTO, but they have tried to divide it up into sort of six or seven main headings. So there are negotiations and proposals going on around enabling e-commerce, so that, that um, physical goods trade that's enabled by digital means that Christine talked about. Um, there are discussions around openness in e-commerce, so things like market access, the flow of data across borders, um, intermediary liability and, and some more technical issues. There are uh, really important discussions going on around trust, so business trust, consumer trust, protection, spam, IP rules, privacy, um, cryptography protection and so on. There are some cross-cutting issues that are being talked about, um, so how transparent are those domestic regulations that Hannah mentioned, um, you know, regulatory cooperation, how do we have those conversations about designing the rules in a way that, that fits a cross-border sort of model, capacity building for developing countries. Um, there's a, a lot of work going on on telecoms um, and then into the more traditional services trade space around market access, for example, and of course the cross-cutting sort of general position, um, provisions around institutional issues and dispute settlement. So there's a very wide potential agenda, um, albeit that there's no consensus about, you know, what, what's going to be um, the end product. And I think that, um, you know, really what's happening in the WTO reflects the very rapidly evolving thoughts and ideas and policy approaches that countries are actually responding with. You know, Hannah mentioned that over the course of her research project, people changed their ideas. And I think that that's, that's true across the broader sort of regulatory sweep as well. So, you know, if, if we look at where those negotiations have got to, I guess there are three sort of big challenges. One is that question that I talked about around what exactly is the scope of this exercise? And going to that, what's the end product going to be? Is, is it going to be a, a whole new standalone agreement on digital trade or e-commerce or whatever term you may use? Or is it going to be a question of sort of revising and updating the existing agreements? Um, there's also a really major issue around, uh, I guess, a shorthand for it would be the digital divide. So how do we enable developing economies to engage meaningfully in these discussions? You know, a lot of it's extremely technical. Um, it's evolving rapidly. How do we ensure that actually what we're negotiating is um, sort of a reasonable reflection of different interests and, and capabilities. And then the third issue, which really goes to what Christine talked about, is data. 
um, or for all our North American listeners, data. Um, so data is is at the the root of all of the, I guess you could say, differences in regulatory philosophy and approaches to regulation in this space. So I mean, there are some low hanging areas, uh, low hanging fruit, if you like, around enabling um, you know physical goods trade, and and I understand that there's been very good progress on things like customs procedures and 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 so on um uh, digital single windows e-authentication e-signatures but when it comes to cross-border data flows um you know that is really the the big sticking point and i think you know we see some quite considerable differences in approach between china the united states and the eu between developed and developing countries it's it's really at the heart of you know where the major controversies lie in this space. So the goal is to try to get substantial progress, some sort of concrete outcomes at the next ministerial meeting of the WTO, which is tentatively scheduled for the middle of next year. But I think it's very much an open question as to whether they, they get there, particularly on the data flows, or perhaps um, lowering their sites to something that's still very commercially meaningful. It actually matters to the bottom lines of businesses to do this sort of digital trade facilitation work that I, I mentioned, e-signatures um, and, and, you know, enabling physical goods trade through digital means. But the nub of it, the data flows issues, still very much, uh, you know, to, to be worked on. Thanks, Juan. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Christine, you have many years of experience in trade negotiations. How do you view the ongoing e-commerce negotiations at the WTO. Um, what do you think the key to success is here? Oh, thank, thank you, Han. And um, certainly Stephanie did um, an, an excellent job of really um, going through the lay of the land and, and where things stand. Um, but, but a couple of thoughts as I, I was listening to Stephanie. I think, first of all, it's important to remember that in between the Doha round and the services negotiations and the kind of collapse of the Doha round, you had the TISA negotiations, the trade agreement, uh, the trade and, serv and services agreement. Um, and there was an important part of the TISA negotiations that did deal with data flows. And it, it was really um, one of the first times that the US um, was making an effort to try and make uh, data flow rules more multilateralized. Now, recognizing that there was progress in TPP and then CPTPP um, and in some of the, U in the US FTAs, but, but TISA was broader than that. Um, and so I think that that, that work um, was an important element that hopefully will continue to flow into the work that um, Stephanie described that became the, the joint statement initiative on electronic commerce. Um, the, the second thing I wanna say is that um, it's important not to underestimate the impact that India and South Africa in particular have had in a negative way um, on the overall negotiations and the effort to move forward. They've focused a lot of their efforts in opposing the continuation of the e-commerce moratorium. And there are, their arguments have shifted in that regard. Um, they started out by arguing that the advent of 3D printing was gonna take away revenue from developing economies. And then now it's more shifted to, well, we really need to protect our, our infant industries in, in the digital, um sector so um that is an important battle that needs to be won i think overall in an ongoing fight a fight the second thing i would say is stephanie highlighted that there are major continuing differences on data flows um and on data localization although as i said a little bit of progress or maybe light at the end of the tunnel on data localization, at least with respect to the US and the EU. Um, but as Stephanie, uh, Stephanie indicated, you have China opposing any, the inclusion of any rules on data flows in an e-commerce agreement. 
Then you have the major disagreements that continue between the US and the EU. Um, and it's very notable that today, I think we're gonna have an announcement if we haven't already from the EU on its Digital Services Act and its um, Digital Market Access Act, which are clearly going to have a major impact on major US um, platforms that are operating in the EU. Um, and this is on top of the ongoing uh, controversy over digital service, services taxes, which aren't even really addressed um, in the e-commerce agreement. Um, and the other area of significant difference is services market access. And I think one of the sources of reluctance um, for countries to really um, rush to sign up to make greater commitments in this area is the MFN issue and the concern that if they make more market access concessions, they're just not sure how this e-commerce agreement is going to be implemented. Uh, will it, as Stephanie said, be a standalone agreement? Will it be integrated into existing agreements under the WTO? And will MFN apply so that commitments made will be available to all WTO members? So I think that's another major issue in the negotiations. The last thing I would say is while we absolutely want to see as much progress as possible, um, and I think there's been tremendous leadership by Australia, Singapore, um, and Japan of the e-commerce negotiations. Um, I think it's questionable um, about whether you will see much beyond agreement on a consolidated text, not on the individual provisions, but just in consolidating the text. And the other key piece um, I would say is there really needs to be agreement on extending the e-commerce moratorium. Um, and I think unfortunately that fight is gonna continue. And that's both a fight outside of the e-commerce negotiations and in the context of the e-commerce negotiations as well. So let me stop there. I, I don't mean to be completely pessimistic, but but I do think there are huge barriers to get across. and I. And I think all the, the bilateral and regional work that's going on is critical to finally and ultimately unlock, unlocking disputes um, over issues on the multilateral side. Thank you, Christine. Uh, we have some great questions coming in. Uh, one question is from David Scott. Um, how can government levy tariffs on the transmission of services and ideas across global boundaries? Um, and the ne next question is, um, if we tax from Warren Coat, uh, if we tax physical goods, uh, but not tax digital trade, is it a subsidize to for digital trade? Um, I would like to start um, this question with Christine and see if you have any thoughts. Um, well, I guess just going right to the heart of the subsidies question, um, I don't think there's a one for one correlation uh, between a digital good and a physical good necessarily. Um, and I think that there are ways of dealing with that once uh, perhaps behind the border um, in a way that's non-discriminatory so that the same tax is applied to both foreign and domestic suppliers of a particular physical good. Um, I think the question with respect to a tax on services um, is, is a very um, important one. And I think the key there is that uh, any tax that is imposed be non-discriminatory um, and it be imposed um, in the least res restrictive manner possible. But I think the key in that regard is really non-discrimination. And uh, let me pause there and um, hear from Steph and Hannah. Yeah, Stephanie, would you like to weigh in to these questions? Well, uh, thanks, Juan. I mean, uh, I guess uh, just just to say on the question of taxing electronic transmissions, I, I absolutely agree with Christine that uh, 
you know, the, the moratorium is very much uh, that was agreed by the, has been agreed every two years by WTO members, is unfortunately very much uh, under a cloud. It's, it's back on the table. And uh, I know that there are some countries that would be keen to see it go. But, you know, the work that um, some great economists um, have done, uh, Hozuk Lee Makiyama, for example, at the European Centre for International Political Economy, uh, has done some work and, and other colleagues uh, looking at what's the impact of taxing, uh, you know, electronic transmissions. And really the, the work that he's done has highlighted the fact that while there may be some modest revenue uh, to be had, in fact, the broader impact on the economy uh, of countries that might introduce those sorts of uh, policies um, really, uh, you know, far outweighs in a negative sense any possible revenue that might be gathered. I, I think, you know, if you take a step back and look at, well, how can we enable this, this digital transformation? How can we leverage essentially digital technology to grow prosperity in our economies, you know, taxing those sorts of, um, whether it's digital services or electronic transmissions, uh, you know, doesn't make a lot of sense if it's done, as, as Christine said, in a discriminatory way. Um, but of course, uh, I'm, I'm a former New Zealand trade negotiator, so I think uh, <laughs> tariffs of any sort are, are not a good idea. But over to you, Hannah, if you'd like to add anything. Um. It's, uh, well, you guys covered it very, very well. I think it, uh, an important thing to think about there is that the, the issue of uh, e-commerce and the moratorium there is one of those where you have the digital divide and you have different countries having different resources in tackling these issues. So I've been working with the WTO putting together sessions for the, the, you know, the full assembly of member states there. And there's one thing being the EU or New Zealand or US or Canada or Australia, you know, grappling with these questions, having um, experts in house basically and being able to make these analyses. But it's another thing to be, you know, Nigeria, where you hear that data is a new oil and you have a large population and people want access and you just have to throw something up there because you're worried, but you don't have the bandwidth basically. Um, to make that analysis. So there the WTO has really done a lot of heavy lifting and um, Hosuk study and, and others there uh, are imperative because it's very much a question of having the right information to make the decisions. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, it's definitely tricky to negotiate with a large number of countries because each of them will have their own public policy objectives and considerations. Uh, to make any meaningful progress at an international level, we'll think the US and EU has to be stay on the same page. Uh, and there are some reasons to believe that should happen because you know each uh, accounts for a significant portion of the other side's e-commerce trade and they share a lot of uh, same values. But um, Hannah, do you think it would be an easy task for the UN and EU to reach an agreement on digital trade? Uh, and what do you think are the biggest differences on digital trade policies between the US and EU? And also, um, I saw questions um, online um, from uh, yeah, from um, anonymous. Um, do you think? Uh, the EU, uh, European Union's GDP are limits the functionality of digital trade. Uh, and about the EU's new Digital Service Act and Digital Markets Act, do you think uh, what kind of impact they will have on digital trade? It's a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a tall order. So let me just uh, jump into this very quickly first. So the major differences between the EU and the US and the things that are very hard to bridge is that they have fundamental different approaches to viewing and handling data, right? So the U.S. have been handling data in trade negotiations, negotiations since the Clinton administration, right? Um, but and at the same time, because they were saying it is an international issue, we should be handling it internationally. And but in the mid 90s, which seems to be, you know, sort of the golden age for all of this was also the time that EU got to work on their fundamental approach. Right. Um, and to set up what has become the most central and notorious part of their data regulation, the notorious GDPR. Right. 
which is an update to something that they set up in 1995, which is called the Directive on Data Protection. And already then it held up the adequacy requirement for handling EU citizens' personal data in accordance with privacy protection. So the thing to understand with the EU is that it starts with a fundamental premise that personal data must be kept private. Oh, seems like we... Okay, seems like we lost Hannah. Uh, for now, okay, so, uh, we'll come back. It seems that Shanna, uh, Hannah will have a lot of questions to answer. But Christine, let me move it, move on to, on to you. What do you think are the biggest um, Am policy I back in? differences? Sorry. Oh, yes. She's back. <laughs> All right, Hannah, yeah, you're back. Okay, you just sorry, we, we lost you for a second. Oh, I'm so sorry. So at any rate, so the idea is for the EU is that privacy is a fundamental human right, regardless of it, if it's data flows or anything else, right? So since it's a fundamental human right, it's not negotiated, period. Um, and so it's not DG Trade, it's not DG Connect that handles that, it's DG Justice. And so uh, the EU decides on whether or not you follow the rules that need to go if you want to, to go with our personal data. Uh, and so it comes down to an adequacy decision. And the US had it first uh, uh, under the so-called Safe Harbor Agreement. Um, and, and then it was updated to, um, to the Privacy Shield in 2016. Uh, and, uh, but that was thrown out this summer. And for those who are looking to find the words that you often hear, uh, this the 19, well, this summer's decision to close off the privacy agreement, um, the privacy shield is the Schrems 2, which is the updated version of the Schrems 1. Uh, but in the Schrems 1 in 2013, the uh, issue was Facebook and whether or not they handled the data well. Uh, and now it's about actually US government uh, and surveillance issues. And I'm sort of joking around here saying that it's a sequel and so on, but it's actually a very serious and urgent matter that needs to be solved as soon as possible. And while I think that it's clear that the incoming Biden administration won't have trade in general as the top of the agenda, uh, enabling transatlantic data flows is something that really needs to be a priority. Uh, and I think Christine will agree. Uh, and it's especially so for SMEs. Um, so, and, but taking out the question of, of um, data flows that pertains to personal data, the EU is committed to the free flow of data. And we have even a regulation for that too, but it's not as well known. Um, so remember that EU regulation is the result of political wrangling of all the 27 member states. So whenever the EU sets out to discuss regulations internationally, they've already done sort of a dry run or have that experience uh, in doing it within the single market. So while working through the national regulations within the single market, the EU has defined different types of localization requirements, data computing and processing as protectionist. And this is something that they're now standing behind even in the international arena. Um, so in the proposed text at the WTO and also the proposed text for bilateral EU trade agreements. <clears throat> I tried to keep okay. that really short since I fell out. <sighs> Hannah, uh, great. Since you, yeah, since uh, Hannah, I have a follow up question for you. So since you talk about you yeah. know data flows, uh, I have a question from Nicholas um, asking, do you think there will be meaningful agreement on data flows in the WTO e-commerce negotiations? Hannah? Uh, well, if, if it contains anything that that has to do with personal data, data flows and you don't sort of come up. I mean, in order to get EU to jump on board there, to have that conversation, you would have to come up with 
uh, a conversation on what is personal, what is not personal, how do we handle it, how do we not handle it, because as of now, it's non-negotiable uh, for the EU. So they wouldn't get on that train. Uh, Christine, what do you think? What are the biggest policy differences between EU and US? Well, unfortunately, I think there is a long list and I think Hannah's referred to many of them, but um, if I can start uh, maybe on the WTO side um, and, and just to say that I think one of, one of the things that is very important to note in trying to find a way forward on this is one is that my understanding has been that the, the US in terms of its negotiating position has not objected to the GDPR in and of itself. So that when it makes its data flow, uh, cross-border data flow proposals to the EU, it's not saying get rid of the GDPR. We understand you have regulatory discretion on your side and it's been worked out with the member states. But what they do focus on is how that's administered and what kind of framework exists in terms of the, the, the cross-border data flow piece. Um, and, and that's where I, and, and so um, I understand um, the, the position that Hannah has laid out um, and that it's, it, it's not an easy one to discuss at all, but we would hope that um, it is negotiable to talk about the scope of an exception that might be taken for personal privacy reasons and to cabinet it in as narrowly as possible so that it does not unnecessarily restrict the flow of data. So it's not that I think from the US position that no, never, a country doesn't have right to impose a privacy framework or to impose particular requirements. It's just that those requirements should not be open-ended and not cabined in at all. Um, and that's been the concern about what the EU has proposed in that regard. Let me step back now to the bilateral context and just to echo what Hannah was saying. I think from, from our my perspective and certainly CSI that um, there has to be a continuing priority on resolving the cross-border data flow issue between the US and the EU flowing out of the Schrems II decision um, and whatever new mechanism can be created to take the place of the privacy shield and standard contractual causes, uh, clauses that needs to clearly be a priority for a continuing priority for the Biden administration. So we completely um, agree with that. Um, and, and we would think that there can be a good case that's made that that's not the kind of trade negotiation necessarily that President-elect Biden was talking about when he meant there should be a pause in trade negotiations, that perhaps what he was referring to was more the FTA negotiations themselves. Um, and then secondly, I would say in terms of what other barriers need to be tackled, we are very concerned, um, and we haven't had time to really pour over them yet, but the Digital Services Act requirements um, and the potential penalties for lack of compliance and also the Digital um, Services, the Market Act uh, as well. Um, and, and the last point I would make is we're, we're very concerned about the potential proliferation of discriminatory standards in the EU in the conformity assessment area, um, particularly with respect to AI. Um, and we think, and Han, you were asking a while back about what are the kinds of disciplines that need to be developed. We think that disciplines on digitally enabled services are another element um, that needs to be worked on to really tackle another area of rising digital protectionism. Um, so just to underscore absolutely priority for the US and EU to work together to find a solution. I think incredibly difficult, but hopefully maybe on the Schrems II decision, that could be maybe a, a nearer term goal that might 
we would hope be reached. Thank you, Christine. So now let's move away from the EU and US. Uh, let's look at um, an Asia Pacific area. Around the same time of the SHRIMPS 2 decision, uh, New Zealand, Singapore, and Chile signed the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, DIPA. This is the very first agreement that's dedicated to digital trade. Stephanie, can you tell us what DIPA is about? How is it different in terms of substance and its coverage compared to other work done at, like, say, regional uh, trade agreements or at APAC? Thanks, Juan. Yes, well, I think it's a really in interesting and innovative approach to tackling these issues. I mean, we've just heard a lot about, you know, how to bring uh, the US and the EU together. But of course, there's a, a whole world outside of those uh, two, two large economies as well. Um, and so uh, in the Asia Pacific, there's been a lot of innovation in digital trade. Uh, at Juan, as you say, the DEPA, Digital Economy Partnership Agreement between New Zealand, Singapore and Chile. Uh, similarly, Australia and Singapore have uh, also this year signed a digital economy agreement. And essentially what these digital first agreements try to do is look at the digital economy more holistically. So what aspects of the digital economy can support trade in the digital era? And um, essentially, these agreements go far wider than the WTO, than, than some of the discussions between the US and the EU, and look at all aspects of the digital economy. So they, they cover very fundamentally data flow issues, and, and in that respect, they're based on what is in the CPTPP agreement. Um, so, you know, the predisposition towards open and free flows of data across borders. But they really go into other broader areas as well. So, for example, um, these agreements look at things like artificial intelligence, at digital identities, which are, of course, fundamental to a lot of uh, digital transactions um, in, in trade and more broadly. Uh, things like... Um, you know, innovation and how do we respond to emerging technologies, uh, the Internet of Things, 5G and so on. So really, um, the way these these digital first agreements are designed is quite a different uh, approach to more traditional FTA e-commerce chapters. And um, the way that DEPA in particular has been designed is in modules. So each module could potentially be picked up and and transported into another agreement or perhaps, and I think this was very much a deliberate intent of the, the authors of this agreement, to be used as a pathfinder for what's possible in the WTO. So it provides essentially um, a way for these, these small, uh, you know, economies to be creative in their policy making and think about how you could address these issues um, and, and show the way to, to the rest of the world. And I think, uh, you know, if I may just sort of move on from that uh, deeper agreement into APEC, I think something that's very clear in both of those contexts is the engagement and role of the private sector. Because I think in this area, more than other parts of trade, you know, business really has the ideas, the knowledge and, and you know, the, the creative thinking about how to do these things. So APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, which New Zealand is going to be chairing this coming year, is another place where those conversations can happen um, in that context without negotiating, but really just exploring this very rapidly evolving part of the economy. And I think that model is actually very useful for things like resolving the US and EU can sort of disputes and, um, and also in the WTO, really to actually understand explore and design good policy solutions for this very fast evolving uh, part of the economy. From Yoast, uh, who asked, um, what are, there are some big obstacles for developing countries to participate in digital trade uh, related to infrastructure and domestic regulation. Um, does DIPA address that, Stephanie? Uh, it does. In fact, um, unusually, there's a whole um, module on digital inclusion, which is, uh, you know, I think a kind of a world first, um, reflecting the fact that obviously developing countries have uh, 
you know, technological and capability and infrastructure challenges, but also even within relatively wealthy economies like New Zealand, uh, you know, it's it's not universal that people have access to digital infrastructure, have the skills to be able to engage effectively with that as businesses, you know, lots of small businesses that, as Hannah has mentioned, you know, don't don't have the the capability to engage effectively and use digital tools, and so um, digital inclusion is very much part of the deeper enabling small uh, businesses is is part of it. There's a, a digital dialogue that's that's um, mandated in the deeper uh, to engage with small businesses, but also, and I think this is also uh, you know a kind of a first. Indigenous data issues are, are very much on the agenda. So data sovereignty for Indigenous communities and so on, reflecting, I guess, a, a more um, sort of holistic view of economies and communities, uh, not just, uh, you know, kind of the um, old model of, of large corporates engaging on these issues, but in fact, how to enable uh, everybody in, in the community or in society. Thank you, Stephanie. As we're running out on time, we'll have to wrap it up. Sorry that I couldn't get to all the questions. I would like to thank our panelists for your great insights and thank our audience for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. The video recording of this event will be available on Cato's webpage later today or tomorrow. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>